year. <laughs> this is my really, I, This is one of my favorite things to do. I have to admit, I love doing this not only because it really brings out some talents in kids that I didn't even know existed, and it really helps for them to learn a bit about history too in, them, in this way. So it's always a real fun time for me. And so this is called War, War, and Poor. And you kids have worked really hard, and thank you for helping them learn their lines. Some of them have a lot of lines to learn. <laughs> so, anyway, so I hope you enjoy the show, and uh, we'll get started. The play we're about to see covers the time period between 1914 and 1940. It was a time of war, prosperity, and then financial collapse. We begin our play in the White House. President Woodrow Wilson is discussing the problems between the countries of Europe with his aide, Colonel Edward House. It's 1914, and the world is about to enter the Great War, World War I. In order to understand this part of the play, you need to know what the word alliance means. Alliances are treaties made between friendly countries to defend each other in case of attack. What are treaties made between friendly countries to defend each other in case of attack? Alliances! <laughs> I forgot to tell you, you have a part in this. <laughs> <laughs> Scene 1, the White House, June 28, 1914. Mr. President, the Archduke of Austria Hungary has been assassinated in Sarajevo. I fear the worst. Go on. Remember how I said that Europe is like a powder keg? Yes, but do you think this will be the spark that will set it all off? Yes, every major nation in Europe is on some teeth and fire away with protective alliances. How might these alliances come into play after this assassination? Austria and Hungary will learn Serbia for the assassination and probably invade Serbia. If that happens, I'm certain Russia will come to Serbia's defense and declare war on Austria and Hungary. What about Germany? Germany has an alliance with Austria and Hungary. <laughs> with Austria and Hungary. So we'll strike it. And we'll strike it. Russia. Russia. What about France? They're urging to get back at Germany for what happened in 1870, besides France's arrival. What's Great Britain's position? In Russia. In Russia. What's um, Great Britain's position? They're, they're trying to defend Belgian neutrality and all the relations between Germany and its old enemy, France, is Belgium. It sounds like all of Europe could go to war because of this assassination. Well, let's hope cooler heads prevail over there. Keep me posted. Yes, Mr. President. Scene 2, the White House, August 4th, 1914. Oh. <laughs> 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 we just got this information. Mr. President, we've just gotten this information. Europe's house of cards is toggled. Russia and Hungary is at war with Serbia. Russia is at war with Germany and Austria and Hungary. And, and Germany has invaded Belgium and is striking for France. Why would Germany invade Belgium? Belgium decided not to take sides in this war. Belgium is neutral. What has happened to the German sense of honor? I know that Belgium is neutral, but in this case, military strategy outweighs their sense of honor. Explain what you mean by that. It is easier for the Germans to attack France through Belgium by land rather than by sea. They did it regardless of the political costs, and those costs are pretty high. Meaning Great Britain is now at war too? I'm afraid so. Great Britain has an alliance with Belgium that says if Belgium is attacked, then Great Britain will defend it. We must keep the United States out of it. I will issue a proclamation of neutrality at once. You head for Europe and see if you can arrange a ceasefire. Good luck. I'll do what I can, but I'm not very confident. Hopefully our proclamation of neutrality works better for us than it did for Belgium. We take you now to Germany, into the highest office of the German government, Kaiser Wilhelm II. He is discussing the war with Admiral Scheer and is not in a very good mood. Scene 3, Berlin, Germany, February 4th, 1915. <laughs> In order to understand this part of the play, you need to know what a U-boat is. A U-boat is a German ship that can travel underwater. We call them submarines. What do Germans call submarines? U-boats! 
As more she must do so. Great Britain has blocked the ports of the ships and will not allow our ships to sail to open sea. Each time one of our ships shall leave, they sink it. How can we win this war if our ships cannot leave our harbor? I have an idea. We can do what the British want and leave our fleet of ships in the harbor. What? What kind of strategy is that? I can take you where you command for ships than that. Well, I mean, we can't risk sending our ships out, but we can send our U boats out to surround Great Britain. Yes, yes. I'm beginning to see what you mean. I'm beginning to see what you mean. Our U boats can slip under the British ships that are blocking our harbor. And then we could send them to surround Great Britain. I think the British called them submarines instead of U-boats. What if we encounter enemy ships on the way? And also all enemy ships will be torpedoed. And if the ships are neutral? We can only warn them of the possible danger. Surely they know the risk of sailing the open sea during war. Scene 4, The White House, May 7th, 1915. What? Attacking a passenger ship? What's the Kaiser up to? Get me Brian at once. Or the days, Mr. President. Brian, the United States must lodge a strong and immediate protest. That could jeopardize our battalion. I realize this, but we cannot tolerate such aggression. It's wrong to sink a passenger ship, even in wartime. We will submit strong protests to the German government. Yes, sir. Scene 5, Berlin, Germany, May 24, 1915. Is it, the tr is it true the Americans are expressing their displeasure because we sunk the British ship Lusitania? We warn the Americans not to sell any ships that belong to Great Britain in the war. Yes, it's true. Also, President Wilson is pressuring us to warn any passenger ships before we torpedo them, and then they have a chance to get in the white boats. Warn them before we torpedo them? You know that many of those so called passenger ships are getting ship supplies and ammunition. Still, we don't want any more countries fighting against us. If we continue to keep sinking ships, the neutral countries will declare war on us too. Perhaps we will give warnings, at least for a while. Also, tell President Wilson, we have considered the request, but we will warn ships before attacking them. Also, remind that the United States be neutral and not take sides. Are we really going to give warnings to ships? Yes, until we find it necessary not to. Scene 6, the White House, February 2nd, 1917. The Germans have declared unrestricted submarine warfare on the high seas. You mean they'll even attack unarmed ships? I wonder how long the Kaiser's promise to warn passenger ships will last. That's not all. The British government intercepted an interesting telegram you should hear. Go on. It's from the German Foreign Secretary Zimmerman to the Mexican Foreign Minister. Briefly, it states that if that, Mexi that Germany will pay Mexico a lot of money if Mexico attacks the United States. Why would Germany invade? What? How dare they? These seas are no longer safe. Germany is bribing Mexico to attack our southern border. We may we must be neutral no longer. We must get this country mobilized for a total war effort. Get me? Hoover and General Person at once. Yes, Mr. We will declare war. Yes, Mr.
The American troops made a difference in the war, and slowly Germany and the Central Powers began to lose ground. The U.S. Navy began sinking German U-boats and shipped much-needed food and supplies. The last great battle of the war took place in France in August of 1918, soon after the Germans asked for an armistice. In order to understand this part of the play, you need to know what an armistice is. An armistice is an agreement between countries to stop fighting. What is an agreement between countries to stop fighting called? An armistice! Scene 7, The White House, November 11, 1918. Mr. President, the guns are silent. The Germans have signed an armistice. The Kaiser. Oh, the Kaiser has fled to Holland. Thank God! Our boys certainly did their part. For their sake and the sake of their for the sake, yeah, for their sake and the sake of their children. I hope this is the war to end all wars. What time is the treaty signed? At 11 a.m. this morning. Hmm. At 11 a.m. on the 11th day of the 11th month. I think this day should be remembered and celebrated. Yes, Mr. President, I'll get right on it. The holiday that was created as a result of the end of World War I and was celebrated on November 11th was called Armistice Day. We now call it Veterans Day. What was the holiday that we now call Veterans Day? Armistice Day! <laughs> Soon after November 1918, American troops began returning from the war. Time of celebration began. The returning troops wanted to shake off the hardship of war and return to a happier way of life. Their attitude caught on and soon Americans were in the roaring 20s and having a roaring good time. Act 2, the Roaring Twenties. What made the Roaring Twenties roar? <laughs> Charlie, you made it back from the war. Yeah, boy am I glad to be home. I've had enough of living in trenches day after day in all kinds of weather. It was miserable. It sounds awful. That's not the worst of it. The trenches were filled with rats the size of small dogs. I never knew if the low-lying cubbies was fog or poisonous gas. It was a horror show. It sounds awful, but at least we're going out. Say, speaking of horror shows, did you know your little sister Kathy? This is Mark Jim Gillard with the Suffrage Woman. We have to write the rope while you're fighting in France. What? It's true. Since she and the other woman in town have been marching on marching in working in factories with the nation for you boys. They've been marching on weekends with signs demanding the right to vote. Why would they be doing a thing like that? They say that they can be trusted to the only mission, but they can also be trusted to the right thing when it comes to voting. They even went on a hunger strike. Well, they can serve themselves all they want. Women do not get the right to vote. It's un-American. <laughs> Don't be too sure about that. Kathy, how long have you been listening to our conversation? <laughs> Long enough to know that you don't know what you're talking about. Right now, the 19th Amendment giving women the right to vote has been approved by 35 states, and only one more state needs to approve it before a woman in this country can vote. That's right, so save us place in line at the vote booth in November when we cast our votes for President of the United States. Where is this war coming to? First the war, and now women have the right to vote? What's next? I don't know, but I do, but I do plan to have fun since I'm home, as soon as I find a job that is. Good luck with that. Now that the war is over, factories don't need workers to make tanks and machine guns. They've been sending workers home instead of hiring them. Well, you don't need a job to take us to the movies. It only costs 10 cents each. True, and it will be fun. Who's starring in the movie? Clara Bow and Charlie Chaplin. I just love the way Clara plays. <laughs> <laughs> if we hurry, we can get a good seat up and see the subtitles. <laughs> <laughs> the 19th Amendment giving women the right to vote passed on August 26, 1920. Scene 2, a dance club, New York City. Ladies and gentlemen, ten second, ten, five minutes until the next round of dancing begins. 
haven't registered. If you haven't registered yet, register at the back table. The last couple stand there will win $35. Yes, you heard right, $35. That's a whole week's wages. <laughs> there are two rules. Couples must remain dancing on the dance floor at all times, except during the break, which is 10 minutes on the hour every hour. The second rule is couples must return to the dance floor when the bell rings after the 10 minute break or they will be disqualified. So may the best, or should I say the strongest couple win. We start off our competition with that new dance sensation, the Charleston. Me 
Scene three, the class of Range of the Main, 2022. Okay, come right in grade five. We're gonna have a great history lesson today. I'm so excited, I can't wait. Actually, I can wait. Okay. <laughs> now, class. The 1920s were not only known for new fads, new fashions, and new dances, but it was also the decade of Harry Houdini, Charles Lindbergh, Babe Ruth, and Louis Armstrong. So let's listen as these four important people meet in our classroom for the first time today. Mr. Mitchell? Yes? Harry Houdini couldn't make it. Oh, that's too bad. I would have loved to have seen the great escape artist and hear him tell about the time that he escaped from that underwater cave. That's okay. We still have Babe Ruth and Charles Lindbergh and Louis Armstrong to look forward to. So let's listen as these three prominent people meet in our classroom today. Um, Ms. Mitchell. Yes. Babe Ruth couldn't make it either. Oh, no, Babe Ruth. <laughs> The famous baseball player that first played for the Red Sox and then hit 54 home runs in his first year with the Yankees? He can't make it either. That's okay. We still have Charles Lindbergh and Louis Armstrong. So let's listen as these two very important people meet in our classroom today. Um, Ms. Mitchell, I hate to tell you this, but Charles Lindbergh won't be coming. <laughs> what? I suppose he's too busy now accepting awards and giving interviews. Now that he's won that $25,000 flying nonstop from New York to Paris and is playing the spirit of St. Louis. That's okay, we can still listen to Louis Armstrong sing, What a Wonderful World. I don't think so. <laughs> but why not? Don't those people know how important they were to the 1920s? Why didn't they show up? Because they're all dead! <laughs> As Ms. Mitchell was saying, the 1920s rode on the dance floor in sports and sang arts of all kinds. The economy was booming. More and more people put their money into the stock market than ever before. When people put their money into the stock market, um, they bought a little share of the company. And when companies made profit, everything went smoothly. When they didn't, well, you'll see. Scene four, black, scene four, shoe, Main Street Shoe Shine Shop, Black Tuesday, October 29th, 1920. Sunshine is a big quick I've got to call my broker. Coming right up, sir. Say, aren't you new around here? Yes, I'm working my way through college. Let me give you some advice. Put all your money into the stock market. Then you won't have to shine any more trees. Soon you'll have all the money you need. Is that right? It certainly is. I'm a banker. I should know. You can't miss it. The stock market just keeps on going up and up. Soon you'll have all the money. You'll be rich in no time. Thanks for the advice, but I need to think about it for a while. So yourself, in the meantime, I still need to call my stockbroker. Perhaps that thing tells me how well I'm doing and will change your mind. Perhaps the telephone's over there. Hello, Mr. Jones. How are my stocks doing? Oh, hello, Mr. Riley. I'm glad to call you. I've been trying to reach you all day. Something's going on. The market should be fast. Are you sure it isn't just a temporary setback? People will want to buy stocks again soon. I don't think so. This is very different than the market just before. Listen to the rock. Sell, 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 sell. <laughs> Not good. Uh, well, we, everyone's trying to sell their stocks at low prices. And the sell prices are going low and low. I can't believe it. The bottom has dropped out. Everyone is selling their stocks at a low price just to get out of the market. But I bought my stocks in a very safe company, so I'm sure I. I'm still doing well. Mr. Jones, how are my stocks doing? Not good. No the stocks are worth as much as you like. I'll check on yours. I'm sorry, Mr. Riley, but you're completely wiped out. All your money is gone. Oh, crap. <laughs> All your money is gone. 
gone, gone. I can't believe all my money is gone. Boy, well, my bladder just listened to you and put all my money in the stock market. <laughs> that doesn't matter now, didn't you hear me? Millions of people like me have lost all their money. Soon they'll be shining their own shoes instead of asking you to do it for them. Speaking of shoe shining, would you like me to shine your last shoe now? Might as well. I have a feeling this may be the last shoe shine I needed in a long time. October 29, 1929 marked the beginning of the Great Depression. Many companies went broke, workers lost their jobs, and money was tight. Even the farmer didn't get by without feeling the effects of the Depression. Much of the topsoil on the Great Plains was hardened by the lack of rain. So the sun turned it into a dry powder that was blown away by gusty winds. Soon, the, much of the best farmland in the country was covered in a thick layer of dust, known as the dust bowl. Farmers couldn't grow their crops so they couldn't pay their bills. Many farmers faced situations like this. Scene, Act 3, the Great Depression. Scene 1, Lawton, Oklahoma, Lawton Savings Bank, summer 1937. Mr. Cleary, I'm very sorry, but I have some bad news. What do you mean? Do you want to give an extension on my loan? Mr. Cleary, the hard truth is we cannot carry you along on that loan. What do you mean? You say you throw lots of money on the side. I've been a good customer for over 20 years. I know, I know. You've been a valued customer, but we have our bills to pay, too. Business is business, I'm afraid. But all my things for a little more time. It's a rush of death goes away. So if you get a good copy, I'll be able to pay up. Mr. Clary, we could all be choking on this dust for a very long, long time. I'm sorry, we can't wait any longer. What happened next? The bank has no option but to put the floor closed. Floor closed! You mean you're going to take my farm away? That farm has belonged to him sick later since my great granddaddy signed. I know, and if there was any other way, we'd do it. The farm will be put up for public auction in 30 days. 30 days? Now isn't that something I think you built in 20 years of business? Then as soon as hard times come on, you only give me 30 days to pack up my family and move out? It's not right! It's not fair! Conditions in the cities were just as bad. Many people were, were without jobs. It didn't matter how much you wanted to work, there just wasn't any work. Day after day, men searched for work. They wore out their shoes walking from city to city, but came home with nothing. Some men resorted to selling apples on the street. The madcap years of the 1920s came to a screeching halt on October 24th, 1929. When the stock market crashed, America awoke to find the jazz age over and the world plunged into a depression that would last a decade. From the first, American songwriters reacted to the country's mood. Once I build a railroad,
Maximilian Boots was slowly to France and I was thinking when he dropped the boat, he was scared of it. So you don't even have any money about Holy Bell, all the time to save up your money and I used to be really bad with the boat and spend money. Americans badly needed a way out of the depression. Presidential candidate Franklin D. Roosevelt campaigned on the promise of giving Americans a new deal. Once elected, he set about creating government agencies aimed at getting people back to work. One of the agencies he created was called the Civilian Conservation Corp, or the CCC. Its mission was to pay young men to plant trees for soil erosion in managed flood damaged areas. It was run like a U.S. Army base. Workers were Army fatigues and were issued a Navy Pico. Scene 3, Dulles, Minnesota, Camp 701. Wake up, Ed. You have to be awfully dressed by dog outside for exercise with a stationary chart. I'm not sure I'm ready to push up since it'll be boring. Oh, you just have to exercise for 15 minutes, then you can have dinner myself for breakfast. Mmm, ham, egg, pancakes, and milk. That'll be an upgrade for the two kids who usually don't get that kind of stuff at home. I'm a little nervous about our first day of the job. I hope they don't work us too hard. I've never done any sports work before. I don't care how hard they work us, as long as they give me thirty dollars a month. And after I spend twenty five dollars a month, that'll keep on. That'll help keep their tummies full too. Attention! All right, man, jumping jacks. One, two, three, four. banks after breakfast in a barracks inspection. The four men will issue you a shovel, pickaxe, and a saw. Dismissed! Did you say barracks inspection? Yeah, I guess they weren't kidding when they said this would be all we can all get. Come on, Jack, let's go. We have to face anything on a full stomach. Even a bear I can punch From 1933 to 1942, the Civilian Conservation Corps planted three billion trees, built 13,000 miles of hiking trails, prevented soil erosion, and on 20 million acres of Midwest farmland, strung 89,000 miles of telephone lines, preserved 50 national parks, fought forest fires, and put 3 million young men to work. Although the economy was depressed and life was hard, Americans did survive. They even found ways to have fun. They played marbles, board games, and worked together in their backyard gardens. They listened to radio shows such as Lone Ranger and Superman. They flocked to theaters to see King Kong, The Wizard of Oz, and Shirley Temple. In true American spirit, many of the most popular songs of the time talked about the opposite of the way life really was. The closer played with this popular tune. Where in the money? Where in the money? 
That's 